Hey everyone! In this video we're going to talk about projectile motion. So we'll look at some equations using our vector function for position and then think about like acceleration and velocity and then we'll work out an example. So I'm going to give you the vector equation of the path for ideal projectile motion. Um, but just a note here, this equation ignores a number of effects like frictional drag and um, turning of the earth and things like that. So it's sort of a ideal situation. So here is your vector function. So r of t represents position and that's the path. If you take the point at every um, like input t value, you'll get a series of points which represents the path of this object. So this is going to be equal to the magnitude of v naught times cosine alpha times t and that's the i component of this vector and then plus the magnitude of v naught times sine of alpha times t let's just kind of box that in really quick times t minus one half g times t squared and that is the j component okay so there's a whole lot of symbols going on there but let me just identify what each part is so alpha Okay, alpha represents some angle. So alpha is the projectile's launch angle. Projectile's launch angle. And it could be like um, a firing angle or um, angle of elevation. All of that fits under alpha right here. Then V naught, so V is velocity. So V naught is just the projectile's initial speed. When you take the absolute value, that's when it becomes the speed. So projectiles, if it has it real quick, if it has a negative, it's just indicating direction. Okay, so projectiles initial speed. And then what's G? You might know what G is. It's going to be acceleration due to gravity. So acceleration due to gravity. And let me give you the values for that. So that's approximately 9.81 meters per second squared. Or if you're going to use feet, that's about 3.2, I'm oh sorry, 32.2 feet per second squared. Okay, so our position vector representing the path of some projectile and then the components that go into this equation. Let me break this apart into parametric equations. So we'll sort of separate this I and J component from one another. Um, <clears throat> and then we're actually going to give, I'm going to give you a few other equations and then we'll look at an example. So let's sort of break this apart really quick. Okay, so our parametric equations. Parametric equations. Alright, so we have x. x equals this i component. So it's just going to be the magnitude of v naught times cosine alpha times t. Since I'm breaking it apart into the x and y or i and j components, notice I no longer write i and j. And then this, what does this actually represent? Well, if you think about it, if you were to plot this path of your projectile, <clears throat> and I'll draw you a rough picture in a second, this is the horizontal component. Okay, This would be the x value, this would be the y value if you were to plot points in 2D space. So this is actually your distance, and we'll say downrange. So from like the starting or launch point, the distance down range or horizontally from there. <clears throat> and if it helps really quick, think of this. So watch watch my eraser. I'm going to toss it and just kind of watch its path. So from my starting point, that's the launch point. However I throw it, like let's say I throw it up, that's my angle of elevation. This x here is how far <clears throat> down like horizontally from where I launched it at, where it's going to go. Okay. Not too exciting, but hopefully you get the idea. Let me get pick that up. <clears throat> okay, 
So then let's write the y component. So y <clears throat> is the magnitude of v naught times sine of alpha times t minus one half g times t squared. <clears throat> and if it's the y component, think about what that would represent. It's actually going to be how high the projectile goes. So we'll say height. So height, and that's going to be at t time t as long as t is positive. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, let's get rid of some of this. And then let's draw this picture I was talking about. So I'll just draw you a couple of different ones. So here's my xy coordinate system. And let's say my path, if you kind of recall how the eraser sort of went, it did something like this. So it went like, like that maybe. Okay. <clears throat> and so my projectile is doing that number. And so v naught is the initial velocity. So right at starting point right here. Remember, if velocity is the derivative of position, now you're going back to what you know about derivatives. Derivatives give you like the slope or rate of change at that point of your function, and it's tangent to that function, to that curve. So the velocity here, this initial velocity, is tangent to my curve, but also recall that the derivative this velocity always points in the direction of motion. So it looks something like this. Okay, it's pointing in the direction of motion, but it's tangent to this curve at that point. So that's V naught right there. Now, how about acceleration? So it's acceleration due to gravity. So your acceleration vector is actually pointing straight down like this. <clears throat> All right, let's pick another point. I'll just keep it on the same drawing. Let's say I'm interested in somewhere further down my path. How about right, right there? Okay, that looks sort of like the highest point. Then my velocity there, again, it's gonna point in my direction of motion, but be tangent to my path. So it's gonna look something like that. And then acceleration due to gravity is gonna point straight down again. And now your position vector, just to make it very clear, the position vector is going to be a vector from the origin to that point in space. So your position vector, this is r. It's this vector going right there. So that is how you locate the position. Okay, so two different points with their uh, velocity and acceleration vectors. And I can't really draw r here because it would just be a single dot right there. It's a zero vector. So. Let's see, let me note something for you. Just in case you don't launch from what we would call like zero, zero, like the origin. Let's say I launched from higher up, like I just did with my eraser. I kind of threw it from up here, like my eye level, but then it flew and hit the floor. Okay, so I, I actually launched it from higher than where it's gonna actually fall down at. So note, if the projectile is launched, oops, let's spell that right, launched, and we're going to say from some other point, it could be just x naught, y naught. So some initial position where we're launching from, not necessarily 0, 0. Could be 0, 0, but not necessarily. And then we'll say that basically what changes here, and I'll just sort of write the whole position again really quick, you pretty much just have to add in an x and a y point to these two components here. So you can just say x naught plus v naught cosine alpha t, and that's the i component. And then plus y naught plus the j component. So v naught sine alpha t minus one half g of t squared, j component. <clears throat> All right, so just adding this point to the x or i component and this point to the y or j component. Now, let me give you a few other equations and then we'll look at that example I was talking about. So let's go ahead and get this out of here. And the other equations, the first one is about the maximum height. 
So the highest height that your projectile reaches, based on this drawing, it'd be like basically where I drew that point, the high point before it started to fall again. So you can find that and we can say that that's denoted maybe like Y max. And that's going to be V naught sine alpha quantity squared all over 2G. Okay, so you can use that formula to get the highest point that your projectile hits in space. The second equation here is the flight time. Okay, so how long, what T is, before your projectile hits like the ground again, from launch point to ground. And so that one is T, since it's time, equal to 2 V naught sine alpha divided by G. Okay? So twice the initial velocity times sine of that launch angle over gravity. And then, let's get rid of this one here. One more equation, the range. So the range is, and we can just say range equals this, V naught squared over G times sine of twice that angle, so 2 alpha. Hopefully that's very clear, it's 2 alpha. So now let's look at an example. Okay, so here's this example. A baseball is thrown from the stands 32 feet above the field. So imagine someone's in a baseball stadium, they're in the stands but a little higher up, and they're up there and then they throw a ball, like toward the field and it's thrown at an angle of 30 degrees up from the horizontal. So they're throwing it and they're throwing it kind of upward. When and how far away will the ball strike the ground if its initial speed is 32 feet per second? Okay, so let's see what we know what we're asked. So when and how are the question words. So when means that I'm looking for a time and then how far how far? That's a distance. So I'm looking for some kind of distance. Okay, so I'm just going to write it like that. Distance. And so let's see, we know some things. We know uh, 32 feet above the ground to begin with. So let me just start drawing what that might look like. So you have your person that catches the ball, or then they throw it back or something, but they're not at ground level. So they're up here at 32. 32 for the height initially. They throw it and then it does something like this because they throw it upward and then it drops down to the ground. So 32 feet is this one here above the field. Now they throw it up at an angle. So from the horizontal, so if you create the angle with a axis parallel to the ground, this is the 30 degrees right in there. So they throw it 30 degrees kind of upward like that. Then, what else? When and how far? We do know the initial speed. So we know that initial speed or magnitude of velocity or initial velocity is just 32, 32 feet per second. Okay. All right, and now let's put this together. Now we did just talk about some formulas. One was for flight time. Um, the other one was for range. We had our um, distance downrange formula as well. So I'm actually just going to go right into the position vector and then identify the answer to these two questions using that. Okay, so we have the following. Let me just kind of remind you what that looks like. We had our position function, R of t, and let's just rewrite that here really quick. V naught cosine alpha t, and that was the i component, okay, and then plus, let's see if I can squeeze this in here, this was v naught, oops, sine alpha t minus one half g t squared, and that was our y or j component. Okay, now let me just identify something with you guys. If this point, this vector lands at the point represented in space by this i comma j components, this i part, that's the horizontal distance 
Okay, so this is actually part of what we're looking for. This is just the distance downrange. Okay, then, because that's going to be this part, from here to here. Then, this is the height. We weren't really asked about that, but we are asked about time. Something about the time that it takes to get there. So, let's see what we can plug in. We know, initially, okay, at time zero, we knew some things. We were initially three feet, 32 feet up, so actually I need to add something in here. We did not start at what we would call zero, zero, the origin. We were 32 feet up, so we're going to add in right here. This was the 32, okay, to make our height higher than zero, zero. Okay. Now, my initial velocity or speed was actually also 32. So lots of 32s in this problem. So that one here is 32. So let's write that. So we have the initial speed or velocity was 32, and then cosine of the angle formed with the horizontal, which was 30 degrees. So 30 degrees, and that's going to be times t. So let me just group that, and that's times t and that's the I component, okay? And then if we add in some values back here, this was the 32 from the height of the stands, and then we have plus the initial velocity, which was 32 feet per second, and then sine of the angle, which was 30 degrees, and then, let's see, times T minus one half, but we know gravity. Okay, we know acceleration due to gravity. So one half, this is a different 32, okay? <clears throat> this is acceleration due to gravity, that's that 32 right there. And then times t squared, okay, and that's the j component. Okay, we have a lot of stuff going on there. <clears throat> so let's see what we can simplify here. So we have cosine of 30 degrees is square root 3 over 2. So this is going to be... Let's just write it right there, square root 3 over 2, so I'm going to divide 32 by 2 right there, so it's going to be 16 square root 3, and that's going to be t, and then that's our i component, okay, so i. Alright, then over here, sine of 30 degrees is 1 half, so 32 times a half there, that's 16 again, and so we have, let's kind of just scoot it over a little bit, this 32 in blue, this now becomes 16t, and then in the back here, this is going to divide out and make 16 as well, so minus 16t squared, and that's the j component. Alright, now how do we answer this question? Let me move this square root really quick. Okay, so this was square root 3 over 2. Got it. Now, we just talked about it. If the point in space okay, is represented by the x or i component and then the y or j component, the distance horizontally, this distance downrange, is this x component. And then the height is that y component. So we're going to just use this version of our function and answer the question. So we know the question when and how far, so let's answer that. Here's the how far. This is the distance downrange before we hit the ground, or when we hit the ground. So the distance is 16 square root 3 t. All right. We don't necessarily know the time yet, the time that it took to hit the ground. So we're going to leave it like that just for now and try to find this um, t value. And so what do we know, if you think about it, what do we know when the ball is on the ground, what do we know about its height? So time when ball hits ground. And we have just information right here about the height. Well, if it's on the ground, the height is zero. So we can use that fact. So time when the ball hits the ground, we're going to say zero equals the height right here. So zero equals 32 plus 16t minus 16t squared. And then we'll just solve this quadratic equation. So we kind of just kind of think about it for a second. 
Falls on the ground, height is zero, so we can solve for t that way. So it does equal zero, so I can go ahead and divide. So I'm going to divide out negative 16. So I have zero equals t squared minus t plus, actually that one's also minus, two. Okay, so I just divided everything by negative 16 and rearranged my terms. And this one factors really nicely. This one's t minus two times t plus one. And then if we just set each factor to zero, we're gonna get t equals two and t equals one, sorry, negative one. And only one of these makes sense for the context of this problem. We don't start our time at a negative value like that. This is a real life situation. So the only one that works is the positive one. So the answer for one of, part, one of the parts is the ball hits the ground at, we'll say after or at two seconds. Because if you remember the information we were given in terms of um, any, any time was seconds. So we're dealing with seconds here. Then we can use that to get the distance. So at two seconds, that's when the ball's on the ground. So we just plug in two. So this is just 32 square root 3. Final answer, but if you want a decimal, let's see, I got uh, 55.4 feet. So this is about 55.4 feet. And that is the distance that the ball traveled from the launching point, but the horizontal distance. All right, so we used our vector valued function to just sort of break this down into a horizontal and vertical components and then use that information to answer this question. Okay, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching.